Welcome everyone. This is a workshop for the Seattle Historic Waterfront Grant Program. Um, just a quick reminder that these applications will be due on the uh, 21st of October this year and here on the slide you can see my contact information uh, below. As you can see, my name is Jennifer Mortensen and I work for an organization called the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, we're a nonprofit statewide advocacy group and we were selected to uh, partner with the city in managing this program. This is a great opportunity for us as a, an advocacy organization to uh, get involved in some um, work on the waterfront uh, and meet some folks who own some historic buildings. So as I mentioned, uh, this is a grant related to the Se Seattle waterfront and it the money is coming from the city of Seattle because of a project they did um, to replace uh, the Elliott Bay seawall. Um, so this seawall uh, was a historic structure and as part of the replacement of that seawall, um, they were required to provide mitigation for other historic resources in the vicinity of that seawall. And part of that uh, mitigation is these uh, grants for, for other historic resources um, nearby. The um, area of potential effect, as you see in that first bullet point, is the area outlined here in red. So um, that was part of the mitigation um, agreement for the seawall was that the grant funds would go toward properties basically close enough to the seawall that potentially could have been negatively affected. Um, so that is why the area of the grant is restricted to this basically red line. It's um, obviously the piers, as you see, and then about, you know, one building's worth in um, on, on the waterfront there. So um, if you have any questions about this boundary or would like a higher resolution um, copy of this image, uh, it's, it's pretty high resolution in the, in the application document, but I'm happy to answer questions about, about that as well. Um, so the, the other point about this uh, grant program here is that it must be an, an identified historic resource. And what that means is that on a survey at some point, it was identified as a, a potentially historic building or, or potentially eligible for listing in a register, essentially. So there is a list provided in the application document that you can look at that basically is from about 2009, which was the last historic survey. So there could be buildings in this area that are eligible that either have become of age since 2009 um, or were missed in the 2009 survey. That's just a basic list of what is on file right now. So if you have any questions about your building's eligibility, um, just, co just contact me directly and I'm happy to talk about that and we will uh, make sure it's reviewed by the proper folks to get you that answer. Um, as far as being listed a landmark, um, you are not required to be a landmark to participate in this program. However, any buildings that are listed either with the City of Seattle or on the National Register will receive priority consideration, basically additional points for that listing in the application review. So eligible projects. The project has to be one of two uh, things, either a facade improvement or seismic retrofit planning. So a facade improvement includes basically anything on the exterior of the building that the public can see, um, whether it's windows or siding or things like that. And then of course seismic retrofit planning um, is hiring a consultant to um, do an assessment of your building or to um, create a seismic plan. These, these grants are, are not very big, so obviously it's not going to be enough money to um, actually do seismic retrofit on a, a, a building. So that is why the, um, the program decided that the, the grants would go toward the planning aspect because the $25,000 limit could really have a, a pretty good uh, impact on a, on a planning document. Other eligibility requirements include um, 
complying with the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. So basically, there is a set of standards that is released by the National Park Service and is pretty universal across most jurisdictions as far as historic preservation is concerned. And any project that you propose will need to align with those standards in order to be eligible to receive funding. And along those lines, any proposed work will need to be reviewed by the Washington Trust, the organization that I work for, which is a nonprofit, and the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, who is um, the state regulatory agency for um, preservation and archaeology. Um, that is if it is not listed as a landmark. If it is listed as a landmark in the city of Seattle, then you will need to go through the regular process with the city of Seattle um, and have it re reviewed by the Landmarks Board. This, this grant program does not circumvent that process. So the grant guidelines, as I mentioned, um, applicants may request up to $25,000 in grant funding and um, you must also match that amount uh, by at least 50% in your, in your own cash or contributions to the project. So what that means is um, basically you can kind of think of it as a recipe, sort of two parts grant, one part your contribution at a minimum. Um, so if you were requesting the full $25,000, your match would need to be at least $12,500. Um, now that doesn't, you could obviously match more if you wanted to request $25,000 to support a $50,000 project, that's, that's wonderful and that's completely allowed. Um, we just have that minimum match of 50,000, sorry, of 50%. Um, Another important point is that funding will be provided on a reimbursement basis only, which means that you basically need to do the project first, submit proofs of payment and proper documentation, and of course, um, have the work reviewed to make sure it meets the historic standards. And then once you've proven all of that, then you can receive the grant money as a reimbursement. This is not a process by which we hand out the money first, and then, and then wait for the project to be done. Uh, the project must be completed first and reimbursement uh, is, is a process of um, submitting all of your uh, proofs of payment and, and proper documentation. Along those lines, uh, expenses should not be incurred before there's a contract in place with the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, so if you're awarded a grant and you need to, um, if you're awarded a grant, you will need to wait until that contract is in place to start basically spending on the grant funds. If you are, are doing something that you wanted to count as match, um, then, then that could potentially um, start a little bit sooner, but as a general rule, um, you cannot spend any funding that you plan to be reimbursed uh, through the grant until the contract is signed by both parties. So um, we do have a note that if there are expenses that you've started since January 1st of this year, um, you know, maybe you're in the middle of a project or you literally just replaced some windows or something like that that is uh, meets the standards and is part of your project, <coughs> those those expenses can count toward couldn't count toward the match but anything um, that will be directly reimbursed with grant dollars needs to start after the contract is signed next bullet is as i mentioned before expenses must be properly documented so that means um, you know not only receipts and invoices but we'll also need to basically see proofs of payment that money exited your checking or, or credit card uh, accounts, um, unless on the receipted notes, you know, paid by credit card with your last four digits or something like that. Um, and then the grants must be completed by December 31st of 2021. Types of expenses uh, that are eligible for the grant funds include basic construction costs and building materials um, for those facade projects um, and permitting fees. 
And then of course, design and engineering services for a seismic retrofit plan. That's the other kind of area of grant funding. So those, any of those can be eligible for having grant funds put toward them. And then if you had other expenses of, in the second section, it could count toward match, which is um, preservation consulting if you wanted to um, get your property listed as a landmark as part of this process. Um, if you need some design or engineering services for the facade project, um, that could count toward match. And then any in-kind, um, if you do labor yourself or donate materials to the project, that can also count toward match. The expenses eligible for grant funding, in the first section, can all also be match, but those are the only expenses that can be funded by the grant and the, and the bottom section can be funded um, as match. And I have a note here <clears throat> that grant funds may not be used for property acquisition and that you must demonstrate site control either as a property owner or a tenant um, with, you know, um, uh, confirmation that the property owner is, is aware of your project and supports it, um, it as, part of your, as part of your application that you submit. The way that the grant uh, grants will be evaluated is uh, this list of um, eligibility criteria. First, 20% uh, the historic and community significance of the resource. Um, so basically, kind of how historic is the building. Um, the degree of project urgency, if, um, if there is, uh, if, so for instance, a, a seismic retrofit of a building that's showing um, some pretty serious structural strain would be more high priority than, than some siding replacement. For instance, um, project adherence to the Secretary of Interior Standards, that basically means um, that in addition to requiring that you follow those standards, how well you follow them and how, how well you demonstrate in that application will, will um, be part of how it is um, how it is reviewed and scored. Project applicant readiness, basically, um, if you have funding available to be to begin the project, since it's a reimbursement grant, um, how if the criteria or excuse me the um, um, the professional experience of of the contractors or engineers that you're hiring and how, rel how much relevant experience do they have, things like that. Uh, level of community visual impact basically is the, what is the public benefit um, for the project that you're doing. Um, the designation of the property, like I said, the locally listed and national register listed properties will receive additional um, consideration. And then general quality completeness of the application, um, you know, is it, is it clearly written, easy to understand, um, and organized well? Did you submit all the images we asked for? Things like that. For the application submittal, you will need to submit both a hard copy of your application and the um, attachments and mail, either mail it to our office or deliver it uh, in person if you prefer. Images do not need to be submitted with the hard copy. We just need a copy with all of the relevant signatures um, on file. Um, but I would also like you to submit digital copies of everything because that is likely how the um, review committee will be looking at everything um, uh, digitally. So the digital fillable copy of the application is preferred rather than a scan uh, because that way I can copy and paste information from your, um, from your document and that's fewer typos. Um, and then we would like a digital copy or scan of, you know, any bids that you're um, that you've gotten to support your project, the letter of a you know consent from the property owner, things like that, and then of course digitally submit all of the images. So one copy hard copy, one copy digital. For the hard copy, we don't need images printed, and then for the digital copy, we don't need signatures. We want the fillable PDF document submitted. I see we've got one other person joining us. All right. 
So now we're going to move into the application document, kind of go through it page by page. Um, I do have this message on the um, on the uh, <laughs> application document itself. I created it in Adobe Acrobat, so it, it really works better if you do it in an Adobe product. Acrobat is the professional version, but the the kind of free reader version um, is available for free for download. So it's it's really important that you use Adobe um, to get the kind of all the formulas to work um, as smoothly as possible. Um, and um, if you use especially the Mac program preview, that tends to cause a lot of problems with um, with fillable forms I've found. So just want to get this out there uh, verbally that please download Adobe Reader um, to view and fill out um, your application document. So the first page is kind of basic information about the property and the owner of the property and the applicant of the property if it's, dif if, if it's different. If you are the tenant or you um, are you know, an employee of the owner or something like that. If you're representing the owner, we'd like to have both your information for contact purposes and of course the owner's information um, for, con for pur contact purposes. And then on this first page, we'd really love a very brief summary um, of the proposed project. And this is literally just so that when we're looking at all of the applications and an, an aggregate, we can quickly see and remind ourselves as we're reviewing them which project is which. So, you know, um, this could be just as quick as window and siding repair on the north and east sides of the building or um, full seismic retrofit plan. You know, something very brief, one sentence here, just to remind um, the committee and the staff uh, what, what, um, what your project is. And then these two um, boxes at the bottom should, if, if all is working well uh, with the form, calculate automatically um, from the budget page. So if they don't calculate, calculate automatically, I haven't locked them. You should be able to just go ahead and type in your totals here. Um, but hopefully, if you're using the um, Adobe Reader or Acrobat, things will, will move smoothly and, and you'll be able to to have this auto autofill. The second page is a little bit more about the building. So we definitely want you to list um, up here at the, or note up here at the top, which if it has any specific designation or registered listing. Um, and then uh, a quick summary of original use, historic use that the building um, was designed for, and then obviously uh, current use here, what it is now used for. And that again is kind of a brief overview of, of the building. And then in this next section, um, historic and cultural significance, you can move into the more detailed um, description of the building's historic and cultural significance. Um, feel free if, if your building is listed somewhere and there, you know, there's a description of its significance in that register document to pull that information from there. Um, it, it don't need to reinvent the wheel here, but do remember that the historic and cultural significance is a pretty large portion of the um, of the evaluation of the applications. And so you'll want to be sure to provide enough detail in this section to, um, to demonstrate that to the committee. And you can see that it's a little clunky because it's a PDF, um, but I have another whole page here um, to can basically a continuation sheet here. So um, you can you provide more text than just a half a page. It'd be about a page and a half. Um, if you have some specific historic or cultural um, information that won't fit in here that you think is really important, you can provide that as an attachment. But we don't want, you know, volumes <laughs> of material that we won't we won't have time to read. Um, it is important to even if you're 
attaching additional information um, to fill this section out as a summary. Um, so if, if that's an issue for you, just contact me and, and let me know what you'd like to include and I'll give you some guidance on how to represent that in the, in the form here and what, and what to attach if that's an issue for you. Then we're getting into the proposed project work. So we've basically split it up into phases, sort of a, organized it by phases. So if there are multiple parts to the project you're proposing, um, you can separate them out and give a little bit more description and detail to those phases. Um, for instance, if you wanted to do window and siding repair, you could split those out into two. Um, but many projects may only be one. If you have, you know, 100 windows on your building and you want to repair or replace them all, that could just be one major phase. Um, or for instance, um, seismic retrofit and planning, that's basically one phase because you're hiring a, most likely hiring a, a, another professional to, to go ahead and, and, and do that assessment for you. That would just be one phase and that's, and that's totally fine. I do want to note on this page and in the description up here, um, it, at the top it talks about it, but the emphasis of this program is historic preservation. So um, you should preserve as much historic materials as possible. That means um, repairing historic windows rather than replacing them, um, keeping siding or something like that that is um, even if um, part of the board is, is rotted, you can perhaps cut it in half and continue to use a portion of it. Um, those types of approaches should really be described in these project phase description boxes, these, um, these here. So again, if there are, is, there are, is additional information and additional detail that you want to provide, um, and you will need to provide a project bid from your contractors as well, and if that has additional detail, please do provide a summary here in this section um, for the grant reviewers' um, convenience, and then of course they can dig into the more detailed document, uh, bid document, if, if that's helpful for them. But definitely don't leave this blank. <laughs> fill, fill it in, describe the work you're doing and how it's meeting the standards. So we've got two sections here, two sections here, um, and then the budget page. So I'm actually going to go back oops, sorry, to this page and show you that um, some of these uh, fields on the PDF are connected. So if you were to propose a size retrofit and planning uh, project, fill in a description here. Um, for instance, the fee is maybe $100,000 uh, for this project. You scoot forward to the project budget sheet and it should fill in that phase here and the cost that you've, the total cost that you're planning to, to spend on this project. So um, then um, if there's multiple uh, phases and you've filled in those, um, phase titles, those will all populate in these lines here, as well the estimated costs here. Then it's your job to basically decide um, what you're asking for the grant to cover, and then what you will cover either in your own cash or by donating labor materials or equipment to the project. So for something like seismic retrofit and planning, most likely you'll be hiring a consultant to put this plan together. Um, and so with a project this size, you would likely request the full grant amount um, and then you would be basically on the hook for the rest. Um, so that would be cash that you're contributing to the overall project. And you can see down here that the 75 plus 25 equals the total $100,000 in funding, which matches the overall expense um, of, that, um, of that consultant's fee. But if you were to do um, a facade improvement project, um, for instance, um, window repair and replacement and siding repair replacement. And you can see that these um, 
the text changes size as I type, um, and that's because um, we don't have a lot of room to, to go on multiple lines here, so the, the text will sort of fit to the box, um, hopefully. So let's uh, say that the bid for the window replacement was $20,000 and the bid for the siding repair um, was um, actually, let's say it was 25 and this is uh, 12,500. So this is um, an example of a project where um, you're providing the minimum amount of match possible, which is completely fine. Um, and so it would be pretty easy to just basically say that all of the grant money is going toward the windows and then all of your um, match is going toward the, um, the siding. And then you have a very, um, straightforward uh, looking budget and that's that's pretty easy um, easy to understand and, and see how it's laid out but if for instance your windows and um, siding were not enough to um, cover the entire project including your match Say the windows were 15,000 and the siding was 10,000. So that's enough to get $25,000 of a grant, but you would need to provide additional um, work as your match. So that um, is where um, you could add other exterior features, for instance, a roof replacement uh, for 20,000. So this is where figuring out the budget page and this, and I'm more than happy to help folks as they navigate this with their individual expenses, but this is where the budget page becomes a little bit um, more specific, where if you have something like a roof replacement or um, some type of modification that is visible to the public, but not really a facade improvement, or, you know, maybe it's um, some of the, the pilings underneath your, your pier building, or, or something that, um, that is just not, not quite as hard and fast as the windows and siding on your building, um, then I would use that expense as your match. So I, I would use um, the 15,000 of the grant here, 10,000 of the grant here, and then I would use, I would say all of the roof replacement is going to be the 20,000 here. So that's an example of where there's a, there's this third line is not quite as strong a contender for the grant funds, and that's what you want to put into your match category um, if possible. So if if every line of your project, like window and siding, definitely applies very clearly to the grant criteria, then it doesn't really matter which dollars you say are grant and which dollars you say are matching. But if there is an element like a roof replacement that's not quite as straightforward uh, of a facade improvement, then, that, then you want to make sure that that's in the match category, not the grant category. Like I said, I'm more than happy to go over this specifically with you um, and consider each of your your um, project phases uh, specifically and, and look at some of those numbers with you. And I also wanted to point out that um, any changes you make on this budget page will also be reflected in these other areas. So you saw me changing the descriptions and the numbers um, on that budget page and it, and it all ties together with these other fields, including the next page, which, which is basically a timeline page. So here we want to know when you're hoping to start, when you're planning to finish, and then if you are providing any match, um, which you need to provide at least 50%, um, do you have that cash on hand? So yes is great, but if not, if there's some um, line of credit you need to get or some other um, means that you're anticipating that income, please go ahead and mark no, um, but then in this box here below, um, let us know kind of your plan for securing those funds before 
before the project starts. And then the next section is um, more of a descriptive section to help the um, committee understand the public benefit of your project and the building itself. Um, you can see uh, question A, is the project regularly or occasionally open to the public? Um, if so, please describe. Um, is the historic significance, historic or cultural significance interpreted on site? Does the public, you know, is the public able to experience that when they visit the property? Um, are there specific tours or events that um, highlight that um, history th that are on the property? Um, and then um, how will the project itself um, affect the public access? So, you know, if, if, um, if you're removing, um, you know, site, siding that's historic siding or decorative pieces that have been put over the top, excuse me, historic, if you're removing modern siding that has been put over the historic features of your building and that's coming down and you're repairing those historic features, um, that's a pretty big um, increase to public access for those historic features. So that in addition to the, the, the building itself being historic and the, and the public being able to learn about that potentially on your property, um, how does the project itself increase that, um, increase that access? And then section 11, I basically just have kind of a catch-all additional information box here. If there's anything you wanted to convey in your application um, that you weren't able to fit into any other sections, give you a chance to do that here. And then a list of the attachments that we require. So um, when, when I was talking about submission, obviously this document, this, this application needs to be um, submitted. Um, but in addition to the application document itself, we would like to see copies of any bids, cost estimates from your contractors or um, engineers or other consultants um, that produced the numbers that you're um, referencing in your budget. Um, a description of the credentials of uh, your consultants or um, or contractors. Have they worked on historic buildings before? Um, you know, historic buildings can be pretty tricky to work with um, if and, and they require a pretty um, specific uh, expertise um, in, in the building and design trades. So we want to make sure that that you've you've um, picked some reliable contractors or uh, consultants for your project. So um, I've split the images up into two categories because we want to see um, the overall building itself. So number three here, building images, high resolution photographs of kind of different angles of all sides of the building and kind of how it sits within the public right of way um, and what, you know, what is the context around it. And then um, on the next level, uh, detail images of the specific project. If you're doing a seismic planning project, then um, the images would be some existing, maybe some ex existing exterior damage uh, because of settling or some interior, um, you know, structural features that that um, clearly show um, deterioration. Um, if it's a facade improvement request, then you would show, you know, the deteriorating windows or the deteriorating siding or other historic features or perhaps um, submit some historic images of what the building used to look like and what the building does look like now and what you're planning to, to restore. And then um, because we will um, be sharing these images kind of online um, to, to promote the program. Um, we will need image captions and um, credits. So obviously if, if you've had images of your um, uh, building professionally taken, we want to give that credit, those, those photographers credit. But also um, use this document, the captions document, to help orient the um, review committee to the building and, you know, describe, you know, this is the south side of the building and the second floor and you can see that the, you know, the water penetration has deteriorated the window frame and, and kind of use it to, to help orient um, the, re the review committee uh, to your project. 
And then number six, um, if, there, if the owner is not the person applying for the grant, then you will need to provide a letter of basically consent for the project from the owner. Um, so if you're a tenant or a, man, a building manager of some sort who is initiating the project, we will need to see that letter of, of consent from the owner. And then for any nonprofit uh, applicants, we'll want to see a list of board members and your last annual operating budget. And then the last page here is basically just signatures and certifications. So um, if the building is owned by an individual, fill out this section. If it's owned by an LLC or other entity, please use this section. And then if there is an applicant who is different from the owner, please also fill out this section. So if the, the entity is an LLC and the applicant is perhaps a building manager um, who is an employee of the LLC, um, please go ahead and fill out the LLC information here and the applicant um, themselves uh, here co confirming the, the information in the application. So that is all I had planned for the kind of walkthrough review. That's kind of the high level um, features of uh, the rules around the grant. And then of course that walkthrough of the document. So I am more than happy to take questions. I'm um, not sure about the chat feature, but if folks want to kind of unmute themselves um, and and voice any questions, I'm more than happy to answer those now. Um, I'm also happy to take questions um, personally afterward if you have some very specific project questions that you want to get answered. Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to review projects and budgets and different things before you start filling out the application uh, document and get too far along. So I just had a real quick question. Does it have to do only with the outside of the building? What if the inside needs some work? Um, if the inside needs some work, I would say you should include that as part of your match because the program was very specific when it was created to facade improvements I think that the committee really will want to see the grant dollars go toward the facade the exterior where the public you know can see it um, but if you um, do have additional interior work that you're doing that is great to put in the application either as match or above over and above your match to show that you know you're you're spending a good amount of money on the project and um, keeping keeping the building accessible to the public. So that could certainly go in to the description about public accessibility at the end, even if it is interior work, if it's providing a significant public benefit, I would include it in the the matching portion and include a description in the public benefit portion also um, to show that that also is contributing to the public experience. Okay. And then also with the, um, I just had one question. I'm sure you explained this, but I was also helping customers. But um, with the with the money contribution and the, um, you can also donate labor. Like if you did that stuff yourself, is that kind of how would you calculate that? Into Great it? question. And actually, I didn't go over it because I forgot to include that in the application document. So maybe I'll make a quick note and update that on the website. But um, the standard rate is $25 for volunteer labor. So that's like you as the property owner is helping take off and repair siding or something like that. Um, $25 is pretty standard across most um, preservation grant programs. In per Washington. hour? Per hour, yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, but if you have, if you are a contractor by trade and you own a building and you want to donate your professional hours, or if you have a friend who is a contractor by trade and they're donating their professional, you know, skills, um, then that can be counted at their professional rate. So, um, if, if there is a donation of, um, so if I knew like an electrician that was, had, was licensed commercially, I could use that person. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, that could be used as match. 
I mean, also if if you know them and their their time could also be counted toward um, that um, toward cash as well. Um, but but electrician would probably need to be um, match. I assume that has to do with the interior work you were mentioning. Or just because we have a the hot dog stand on the waterfront and the outside signs could be lit up. More. Oh, okay. yeah. Then that cool. would definitely contribute to the facade for sure. Okay. Good to know. Great. And then, Great. so all of that stuff, like if we volunteered enough hours, that could be contributed as the match. I just want yeah. to make sure. Or do we also need to put money? In? Nope. It can be. Uh, it can be all um, donated all labor. Volunteer. Um, volunteer labor. If if you can add up enough hours, um, it, I know some twenty five dollars can. Um, yeah. it's, it's not too much, but if it does add up, and especially if you have multiple people donating their time, you know, if you get a work party together and there's five people donating, you know, five hours, or I guess four people donating five hours would be um, five hundred dollars. So um, so yeah, it can add up, and um, the match can be either cash or donated materials, labor, or equipment. Um, so and how do you document that? We'll have forms for you um, okay. once you uh, you are selected for a grant. And basically, um, we'll probably make it very similar to some other grant forms we have, which is meet, sort of kind of an honor system where you record your hours by the month on which days you worked and how much you worked and a short description of what you did and you sign the paper saying, you know, saying that you did the work and you weren't paid for it. Um, and then you submit that as part of your um, documentation for the grant. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I see a question in the chat. It says, will all the application details be sent out? So yes, anyone who registered for this workshop um, or anyone who received an email about this workshop, I will definitely be sending out a link to the application, a link to our website, a link to this video um, afterward. And so you'll have my contact information um, and you can look at all over it. All the, all the details I went over kind of at the beginning of the presentation are all listed out in the application document as kind of the first few pages. So all the details are, are listed there um, as well. And then of course you'll have access to this, to this video to review as well. That's all I have. Okay. Anyone else want to jump on audio or chat to ask a couple questions? This is uh, this is Matthew Combe. I'm wondering if you have a, a list of who some of the owners are that this would be relevant for. We're we're a membership organization. I know we have some member buildings down there, but it would be helpful just to know who we should be sending this out to. Um, sure, so we pulled a list of buildings from the, um, basically the, the database with, well actually it was provided in the mitigation materials for the, for the grant program of the buildings that, like I said at the beginning of the a presentation, basically have been documented as potentially eligible since, um, potentially eligible, eligible, since 2009. So we have those addresses. I don't have those building owner names off the top of my head or materials, um, but I think it, um, if we were to look it up with the city, we could at least find a mailing address for um, those owners. And um, if you're a membership organization, do you, do you know, I guess, do you know which owners are prop which members are property owners, or is that um, just not information that your organization collects? We, we probably have a little bit of both. Uh, a lot of our members are property management companies, so okay. they probably manage the buildings. Um, mm -hmm. So we would... Yeah, that makes sense. So I can, um, I can send you a list of the addresses. Send it to them and then they would... Oh, you're breaking up a little bit. You there? Oh, you sorry, me. you broke up a little bit there. Uh -huh. um, so Matthew, or maybe it was me breaking up. It's telling me my internet <laughs> connection is unstable. I can do that if you. Yeah, if you want to send me the the names. Oh, not the names. The addresses. Um, then I can I can use that. 
Perfect. Yeah, that, that's, that's the information I have right offhand. Um, but like I said, um, if there's any people who own a building that they think might be historic in that red line circle on the, um, on the map, um, definitely just contact me. Um, because also in the city of Seattle, um, while the national standard is 50 years old in the city of Seattle, this, the a building only has to be 25 years old um, to be considered potentially historic. Of course, there has to be sort of the historic significance on top of the age, but um, but the but there is a little bit more flexibility with um, age as far as the city is concerned. Sounds good. Okay. When you talk to a British guy and you say that 25 years is historic, it's kind of funny. Welcome to the West Coast of the United States. <laughs> or just America in general. Yeah. yeah, we got some older stuff on the other side of the country, but out here it's, yeah, pretty, got some young stuff. Perfect, thanks. Okay. Give it a couple more minutes in case anyone thinks of any questions. I'm also happy to go back to the application document to reference anything specifically um, or any of the slides beforehand if people had questions um, about the specific content on the slides or the, or the document. I'm good. I'm good. Hello? Hi. So I had one question also. Um, do you guys happen to have any old pictures or is there some sort of uh, place where I could look for the original building that we used to have down here? Because it used to be a bait shop a long time ago and find um, some of those images. Yeah, I could definitely point you in the direction of uh, image databases. So we are an advocacy organization, so we're, we're not an archive personally, um, but we are part of a network of historic organizations in the city and the state who, who do have archives like that. So I would, I would probably direct you first to the City of Seattle Archive, um, the Washington S State Historical Society, and then probably actually where you most likely will find something is uh, Museum of History and Industry, MOHI. Um, um, they, they, they have a really extensive photograph collection. Um, and a lot of it is available online just for browsing. If you want like higher res versions, you'll, um, they do have a, a way for you to um, pay for that, you know, for access to those high, higher resolution photos or, or access to, to use them. So you froze, um, what was the name of that? Sorry, I didn't, I get froze that whole thing you were saying. Oh, sorry. It's the Museum of History and Industry. And I see that um, in the chat, someone just wrote it out. It's MOHAI, M-O-H-A-I is the acronym that they use. And I can, I can include links and details in the follow-up email from, from this um, workshop as well. So you have a direct link to their archive. Um, they're probably going to be the, the, the widest ranging archive. And then I can send you a link to a couple of other um, potential archives. So it kind of depends on, on what's, uh, what's been scanned as well. Um, mm -hmm. Some archives have, you know, a lot of physical documents that um, have not been scanned yet, unfortunately, because of it just takes a lot of time to, to digitize. So um, if you were really dedicated and wanted to make an appointment to, if they're even open, um, to go visit an archive to do deeper dive, um, you could do that, but I think Mohai will probably be the best bet for finding some historic shots. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, well, we're coming up right on one o'clock, a um, little bit early, but um, that's all right. And like I said, if anyone um, has specific questions about their project or their, you know, bids they've gotten or projects they're looking at or how they should structure their budget, um, all those more detailed project specific questions, I'm happy to jump on the phone or to take a quick look at a um, application document that's filled out um, to give you some pointers on, on organizing the budget, things like that. Um, as staff, I will not be scoring your applications. I will be um, just uh, managing the collection and the organization of them. And then we'll have a, a committee of professionals um, and colleagues uh, go ahead and review those and, and score them. And then I'll be managing the projects 
um, moving forward after that. So thank you to everyone for jumping on. Hopefully this was uh, helpful to kind of give you context about um, the parameters of the program and a little bit of detail about how to include information in your application document. Um, like I said, um, give me a call anytime. I'll go ahead and share um, this screen with my contact information um, one last time for anyone. Um, yeah, thanks for joining and uh, contact me if you have any questions. Bye everyone.